from my, the Republican or the conservative I love to hate, Max Boot, senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations, Washington Post columnist, now author. And I, I just have to quote a bit of this. He wrote this for the Post today. President Biden has done an excellent job of calling out, even preempting, Russian propaganda about Ukraine. The U.S. willingness and ability to respond to Russia's so-called war of words have helped build an impressive facade of Western unity, as seen in Germany's decision today to suspend the Nord Stream 2 pipeline from Russia. But even such countermeasures are likely, unlikely to prevent Russian strongman Vladimir Putin from proceeding with an actual rather than simply an oratorical war. Dictators are not dissuaded by having their lies called out. At least this one isn't. On Monday, Putin went through an elaborate charade of deliberation. He convened his security advisors in an ornate czarist palace and demanded that they give him the views of Ukraine while pretending that he had no idea what they were going to say. It resembled nothing so much as a real-life meeting of Spectre, the international crime organization in the James Bond films. The only thing missing was an electric chair to fry a henchman who failed the boss. But Sergei Narishkin, the Russian foreign intelligence chief, looked as if he was afraid that some dire fate was in store for him after he suggested that perhaps Russia could still reach a negotiated solution with Ukraine. Putin demanded, are you proposing starting the negotiation process? Or recognize the Donetsk and Luhansk Republic sovereignty? Speak clearly! Narishkin, perhaps conscious of the fate that awaits so many of uh, Bond nemesis Blofeld's henchmen, began to stutter. I, I, I will support the decision to recognize. Uh-huh. Once the charade of consultation had finished, Putin proceeded to give an hour-long scripted harangue, denying yet again that Ukraine is an actual country whose borders should be respected. He also claimed once again, notwithstanding all evidence to the contrary, that Ukraine somehow poses a military threat to Russia. The entirely predictable conclusion was Russia's recognition of the two breakaway regions of Ukraine, the so-called People's Republics of Donetsk and Luhansk. This was followed by the announcement that Russian peacekeeping forces would enter the republics to protect them from angry imaginary threats. The Russian troops are peacekeepers, of course, in the same sense that the January 6, 2021 attack on the U.S. Capitol was an expression of legitimate political discourse. This is another Orwellian use of language by those bent on destroying truth as a means of destroying democracy. Monday's absurd spectacle in the Kremlin was an exercise in industrial strength gaslighting. Biden and others have called out Putin's lies, but in the end, it doesn't matter. Dictators and demagogues revel in making their subjects believe the nonsensical. It's a sign of their strength. The same phenomenon is evident in the United States, where former President Donald Trump, Putin's number one fan, has convinced most of his followers that he actually won the 2020 election. The difference, of course, is that Trump is still bound, much against his will, to play more or less within the confines of an established constitutional order. Putin long ago erased the last vestiges of legality in Russia and is now bent on destroying the rule of law internationally. His transgressions against Ukraine by trying to change international borders by force threaten the entire basis of the post-1945 liberal world order. Uh, over the years, I came to really dislike Max Boot because, uh, first of all, his uh, intractable position where it concerned the Israeli-Palestinian issue uh, and, and his seeming, to me, warlike attitude where it concerned U.S. foreign policy that, um, and I may be mistaken on this, I, I'm wrong 90% of the time anyway, okay, half the time anyway, but it just seemed like he believed in... Um, the use of force of uh, 
the U.S. military. We had this huge military that we spend uh, three quarters of a trillion dollars a year that we know about. Why not use it? You know, that kind of thing. So over the years, I just developed an intense dislike for Max Boot. But ever since the age of Trump began, um, and Max Boot, along with other conservatives, realized what they had unleashed on the rest of us with their crazy fucking policies for the past 40 years. Um, and he started to write in opposition and speak out in opposition to the orange vomit. Then, you know, uh, all of a sudden, when he and I, unbeknownst to him, he doesn't know I exist, uh, he and I find ourselves on the same page, or at least I found the two of us on the same page, then I have to quote him and I have to say, yeah, I, in these instances, I agree with Max Boot. Okay? Okay. So, as he said, and as I said right at the end of today's podcast, uh, George Herbert Walker Bush fought the 1991 Gulf War because Bush knew how damaging it would be not only to, the, to, to that region, but to the world if Saddam Hussein were allowed to annex Kuwait by force. And the U.S. victory in that conflict helped establish the principle of territorial integrity as a foundation of the post Cold War world. Now, we can argue about that, and uh, I have argued about that particular point of view, but I'm not going to do it today. Back to what Max Boot wrote in the Post today, the 22nd. He wrote, Now Putin seeks to tear down that principle in his quest to reassemble the Russian Empire. He wants to show that the strong can do whatever they want to weaker neighbors. If he succeeds, we will be entering a dangerous new world where dictatorships hold sway and democracies cower. Western resolution in the face of Putin's threat has never been more important or more evident. But Putin has calculated the cost of sanctions, and he is not deterred. Ultimately, he knows the West will not fight for Ukraine. It will be up to Ukrainians to fight for themselves. The only thing holding back a lawless new phase of world history is the willingness of Ukrainians to defend their country against Russian aggression. With his military superiority, Putin can invade Ukraine and maul its armed forces. He can even install a puppet regime in Kyiv, the capital, but he cannot make Ukrainians accept the Russian yoke. He cannot prevent Ukrainians from fighting back, whether with massive people power demonstrations, like the one that toppled the previous pro-Russian ruler in 2014, or with guerrilla tactics, like the one carried out by Ukrainian fighters against Soviet rule in the 40s and 50s. The West must do whatever it can to support Ukrainian patriots. Ukrainians' fight is our fight, too. As Senator John McCain said in 2014 during the last Russian, of invasion, Russian invasion of Ukraine, quote, we are all Ukrainians, end quote. That reference, of course, uh, that Max makes at the end of his column that John McCain said, was when the Russians decided to annex Crimea, which, depending on your point of view, was a part of uh, Ukraine, the Crimea Peninsula. So, this has really been a focal point for me during the past three or four weeks when this has been going on by the Russians. First of all, it, it brings into sharp relief for me, or sharp focus for me, something that was starting to fade, and that is how U.S. foreign policy has been used time and time again to dictate uh, who's going to rule countries that we want to install certain leaders. So many of those countries were in Central America and South America. Uh, one of the... Uh, um, most irritating things to me has been to be an American and, and feel like I, I should support the actions of, of my country, um, but I could never get into that my country right or wrong bullshit. 
and I think where this really came home to me was during the reign of Richard Nixon and Henry Kissinger, who was Nixon's Secretary of State, among other things. Kissinger was the one who organized the assassination uh, of the elected leader of, uh, of uh, Chile. Oh, what the hell? I'm drawing a blank. And the installation in that country then of the dictator Pinochet, who ruled for just long enough to cause uh, death and destruction and fear and terror uh, in that country. Um, and, and I remember thinking at the time when, when that was occurring that this was, not only was it horrifying and, and embarrassing, but how could the United States claim to, to be a beacon of peace and freedom and yada, 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 and, and all this other stuff, and, and be promoting the overthrow of duly elected governments? And it was especially bad, uh, frightening to me because um, Kissinger was a Jew. And I, it just seemed to me that, that he should know better after what he had gone through. And then in 1973, that Chilean military coup, it was a green light to Argentina's military junta for their dirty war. And U.S. support for Pakistan during the Bangladesh Liberation War, despite a genocide at the time being perpetrated by Pakistan. So, it's just been very difficult to see what the Russians are doing where it concerns Ukraine and, and not being reminded constantly of what the United States has done so many times. Hi, Truth Seekers. Mike Malloy here. As you know, we've switched formats and are now broadcast exclusively on the Progressive Voices Network. So that means you get fewer program interruptions, no corporate commercials, and lots of profanity. But our format change also means some of our radio listeners no longer hear the program. It's been a while since I mentioned our podcasts, so you may have forgotten that there is a way to listen to this program anytime you need a good dose of screaming. Visit MikeMalloy.com and subscribe to our podcast. As a podcast subscriber, you can download the program to your mobile device and take me with you wherever you go. And if you have a friend who needs a dose of truth-seeking, you can give a gift subscription as well. That's MikeMalloy.com and never miss a minute of the uncensored fun and frivolity.